I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. And I say that at the beginning of every one of my videos, but it has seldom been truer than it is today because I'm going to show you something that most of you have never seen before. I'm going to be building a beast class quad. What is beast class? This is a 2407 JB motor. This is the motor that I'm going to be building with today. <laughs> You like that? <laughs> oh yeah, Beast Class. Um, Beast Class is similar to X Class. Uh, in fact, X Class and Beast Class builds use the exact same electronics. The goal of X Class is to have an 800 millimeter to I think it's, it's around one meter sized quadcopter so that when you race them, they are visible and spectators can see them without actually needing FPV goggles. Beast class is what happens when somebody goes, that's fine. I love the big beastly powerful motors, but I don't want it to be a one meter in size. It doesn't need to be that big. And you shrink it down as small as the props will let it while still using the same ultra powerful electronics. And that means that it has lighter weight, more maneuverability, and... And I can't wait to see what happens. So I'm going to build this quadcopter today, and I invite you guys to come along with me. The video you're about to watch documents the process of building a beast class quadcopter. In case you don't know what that is, it is a giant, powerful, terrifying, awesome, dangerous freaking machine. This is not a how-to video. There is no how-to video on how to safely build a machine like this. That's like saying I watched a how-to video on base jumping and now I'm going to go jump off a building. Except if you jump off a building without knowing how to base jump, you will probably just kill yourself. But if you build one fly one of these quadcopters without knowing how to do it safely, you could kill someone else. So don't freaking do it. If you decide that you would like to build one of these awesome machines, before you do, ask yourself this question. Am I an idiot? If the answer to that question is yes, do not build one of these machines. If you're not sure whether you're an idiot, ask your friends. Ask more than one of them. They'll probably tell you the truth. Ask the person in the world who thinks the least of you. Am I an idiot? I'm thinking about flying a giant quadcopter with 12-inch props that could just rip your head clean off. Is that a good idea? And if they say, yeah, no, you're okay, man, you're good, more power to you. In all seriousness, guys, this is a whole nother level of danger compared to a typical five inch mini quad freestyle. If you decide to build one of these, build it safely and fly it safely. And don't make me and Catalyst Machine Works regret that we put this stuff out there. On with the video. The frame we're working with today is the Tasmanian that is from Catalyst Machine Works. And it is similar to their Cannonball frame. Their Cannonball was uh, the first X-Class frame that Catalyst Machine Works came up with. And it is pretty big, complicated, and expensive. But everything about X-Class and Beast Class is big, complicated, and expensive. The point of the Tasmanian frame was to bring the price point down as much as you could and have a simpler less complicated, well, to be honest, cheaper, although it's not cheap by any stroke of the imagination frame. The first thing we're going to do in this build is install the PDB. And the PDB that we're working with is from APD. That's actually who also makes the ESCs. The electronics we're using are, they're not, you're, you're not going to find them on Banggood. <laughs> it's 12S voltage and it's a lot of amps. It's hundreds of amps that we're dealing with. Well, honestly, I just said to Neil Whiteley, just send me one of whatever you're building. Uh, he's picked the best parts and I'm following in his footsteps. You can find links to this stuff down in the video description. Catalyst is a great frame designer and they have given you tool paths for all of this stuff. So for example, the stack screws are accessible through the battery plate. Very thoughtful and not a detail that they would ever miss. I'm using nylon standoffs, which is what Catalyst Machine Works recommended. It's always a toss up when you choose between nylon standoffs or metal screws all the way through. Metal screws all the way through are stronger, but they transmit more shock in an, in, in, when the, when the carbon plates flex or whatever in a crash, they transmit that shock straight to the electronics. 
I was really concerned because if this guy breaks off and gets loose, the 12S electricity is not going to be your friend. But Catalyst said they used nylon. And, right. By the same token, if a metal screw comes into contact with something that it shouldn't, the electricity is not going to be your friend. So Catalyst said they used uh, nylon, and that's what I'm going to use as well. I immediately am starting to see that I might have an issue here. Now, I think it's going to be okay. I was worried that this board might be so thick that I wouldn't have enough threads coming up through the PDB to hold the flight controller securely, but I think it's going to be okay. I am notoriously lazy about changing my soldering iron tip, but... In this one case, I think I'll make an exception. I'm gonna to go to the heaviest tip that I've got. Now this is a chisel tip. It would be better to have a beveled tip. They are heavier, they hold more, they have more mass, so they hold more heat. And that's definitely something you want when you're soldering great big joints like this. But I think this chisel tip is gonna be okay. And then the bottom line is it's the biggest one I've got right now. So it'll have to do. And the reason I need a big fat honking chisel tip is that the wire I'm working with is 10 gauge. This is 10 gauge. I have famously made a post on YouTube talking about how wire gauge, and well, the title of the post is wire gauge doesn't matter. And that's an intentionally <laughs> exciting post to get you to watch the video. The point is that on uh, the quadcopters we're typically working with, even though we're pulling maybe 100, 150 amps at the top end, the fact that the wire is so short means that the resistance is so low that the difference between like 12 gauge and 14 gauge isn't that important. But we're going to be pulling a lot of amps. And so this is like the one time when going up to 10 gauge is going to be necessary. People are annoyed at me for not using a stripper. That's okay. I just use what I've got at hand. I got this little sheet of silicone that I use uh, so I don't drip solder on my nice, on my nice cutting mat. And we are going all the way up to 850 degrees Fahrenheit. And this would be a great time for me to use my big hunk of thick solder. I don't have a lot of it left. This is a way thicker solder than I usually use. Here's the solder that I usually use. I accidentally ordered this stuff and this is gonna be the perfect time to use it. This big flat surface of the chisel tip is just perfect for working with this great big wire. You just want to make sure that the wire is hot enough to soak in the solder and that the solder gets completely into the wire. Using my fume extractor. key to soldering is that the wire needs to be hot enough to soak up the solder. The mistake people often make is they try to like put the solder on the tip, but then how's it going to get into the wire? Well, it, it can't. Now, normally what I like to do is build up a kind of a blob of solder on top of the pad. And that is what helps hold the joint together. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that here. Oh no, I can, I kind of got it. I don't like to have to add solder while I'm soldering. Um, what I'm doing is I'm kind of holding the tip just slightly off of the pad and feeding solder into a, a sort of a bubble that forms up above the pad that keeps it from dropping down through this hole onto the other side. I got it kind of at an angle and I'm just kind of letting it feed in there. That should do all right. The gist of good soldering is though, that you heat the wire and you heat the pad and that causes the solder to become molten and flow. And we're gonna see how that goes. Mm. This wire is a little bit too long for the pad. It should be about the same size as the pad, but well, I guess I could trim it. I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna try to make contact with the flat of the chisel on the wire, but also to flow and heat the pad at the same time. Oh, that worked really well, actually. Wow. Wow, that big honking tip did a fantastic job. It just flowed like nobody's business. The size of your tip makes such a big difference 
in soldering. It really is amazing. That that flowed in no time. I really thought it was going to be more difficult than that. I really shouldn't adjust my camera with my freaking soldering iron right in my hand, but hey, so I'm going to hold this slightly off center so that I can get the chi the tip of the iron sideways against it and get the tip of the iron down and kind of touch the pad at the same time. I want to see everything flow together and become liquid all at the same time. When the whole joint becomes liquid, and there's no better way to demonstrate that on, than on these great big honking joints where you can really see what's happening. And it happens so much slower on these big joints because they take longer to take the heat. When the whole joint becomes liquid, all of the solder and the wire and on the pad is liquid and, and smooth and fluid. That's when you get good joints. Take a closer look at this joint here. And it's pretty silly for me to be doing soldering 101 on this build because if you're not already really good at soldering, just you're not, you shouldn't be building this quadcopter. This is no joke. But it, a lot of people are going to watch this who are just curious. And these great big joints are so good for demonstrating basic soldering technique. You can really see how just the whole thing has become liquid and flowed smoothly together. It's most clear on this side where you can see this blob of solder here. This is called a fillet. And it refers to where the liquid solder has filled in the gap between the wire and the pad. And it's a nice smooth fillet. And technically, I think this fillet is a little bit too much solder. A fillet should ideally be concave. It shouldn't blob out like this one is. So technically, if I was soldering for NASA, they would reject this, but it's pretty good. It's also off center. It's off center because like I said, I, I wanted to be able to come in sort of diagonally and touch both the wire and the pad at the same time. Yeah, yeah it's fully on the pad, so we're, we're good here. This is good enough for me, I think. Here's the ESC that we're using. It's the APD 120F3. That's 120 amp ESC. And <laughs> they've even said here, install capacitor before power up. No kidding. These capacitors are not optional. They are mandatory or these guys will just pop. And they're like $100 a piece. I don't remember exactly what I paid for them, but they're not cheap, so don't screw around. And in fact, I'm going to paint these guys with conformal before I solder them because the backside I'm not going to be able to get at. Jeez, look at those FETs. Should probably be using a anti static wrist strap right now, but I don't have one, so I guess who cares? Uh, yeah, just working with $100 FETs without any static protection right now. Some electronics professional is dying inside just a little bit. Why don't we use electronics protection in this hobby? Well, one reason is that not using electronics protection often doesn't cause just a, an immediate catastrophic failure of the electronics it causes a reduction in lifespan. And the lifespan of these guys is not terribly long anyway, because we smash them into the ground at 300 miles an hour. So it'll be all right. I'm gonna paint these guys with conformal both before and after I solder them up. I just wanna make sure, well, first of all, I just feel like at the more conformal I put on here, the better. And I wanna make sure that any parts that maybe aren't accessible after I install them get coated. Um, there's no problem with soldering conformal on before you solder. The, the soldering iron will just burn through, so it's no big deal. And there's nothing on these ESCs like a, a barometer or a, or a bootloader button that would be damaged by the conformal. And Neil Whiteley assures me that the conformal coating is absolutely mandatory when you're dealing with 12S voltage, a little bit of moisture can really wreck your day. The higher the voltage, the more current flows at the lower the resistances. And normally the voltages we're dealing with down around 17 volts or whatever, 18 volts, maybe 22 volts, it's just not enough voltage to cause damaging current flow based on the resistance of something like a droplet of water. But once you're getting into the 50, 60 volts range, 
50, 50, 60 volts, hmm, DC. That's still not enough to really be dangerous to human. With dry skin, you could hold 50 volts in your hands and not really hurt yourself. With wet skin, you, you probably, you might feel it. It's a good, we should go watch that Electro Boom video where he shocks himself with DC and AC to try to uh, <laughs> see which is more painful. Okay, we're gonna let these dry. And I'm gonna put another coat on after I solder it because some of it's gonna burn off while I solder it and I figure an extra coat won't hurt. But we'll let these dry, I'll get the other side and then we'll come back and we'll pick up where we left off. And actually on closer examination, it looks like, you see that sheen there? It actually looks like they come from the factory conformal coated, but I'm gonna add some anyway because uh, a little more I don't think is gonna hurt. I just want to acknowledge that, yeah, they they already thought of that. <laughs> I'm having to feed a ton of this solder in here because it is so thin. It really needs to be thicker. I'm just getting a ton of smoke. So I'm going to just heat the pad and get it sort of wet. But then I'm holding the iron at an angle and feeding and just building up a pool on top of the pad is what I'm trying to do. Especially when you're not very familiar with the build, it's so easy to uh, build out the whole like base plate and then realize that, oops, there's an arm that goes gets in the way or something. So I'm just gonna set the arm in here and think about how this is gonna get routed. You'll run your cables some way, you'll cut them to exactly the right length. And then when you go to put the rest of the quad together, oops, you'll realize you screwed up and it, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna try and come at this from the side so maybe you can see a little better. Oh, come on now, how it's gonna go. There we go. That is how it should be, guys. That's how it should be. If you have trouble, if it doesn't work like that, your iron is not the right temperature, your your equipment isn't, your, your, your tip may be oxidized, even on these great big joints with 10 gauge wires, this is a, it's a 850 Fahrenheit. It's like a 60 watt iron. You don't need special equipment. You just need equipment that's working right. So if you're having trouble, if your stuff is not flowing like that, this is a bit of a cop out of an answer because say, well, you some, something isn't right. You got to figure out what's not right and fix it. Don't just keep pounding at it and poking at it and trying to get it to flow and it doesn't flow and you're like, well, that one's okay. Stop, figure out what's wrong. Ask a, ask a friend, ask an expert, figure it out and then get it working right and it'll be easy. Well, okay, I, I probably shouldn't discount that I've been soldering for a long time. Probably technique has a little bit to do with it. But at the end of the day, you touch the iron to the pad and the wire, it flows, it becomes liquid pretty quickly. And then the joint, if, if that doesn't happen, stop, back up, something right. I'm gonna get these wires cut to length. I'm gonna go ahead and insert the ESC into the holder. And we'll cut these to the right length. I'm gonna give them a little slack. I always wanna give the wires a little slack uh, just to you know help me tweak the layout or just cause it's never good to have too much tension on wires. It just causes stress on everything. You don't want your wires to be stressed. You want them to be relaxed. You just want them to have not so much tension. Sometimes it's good to give them a little bit of a massage. You know, you just gotta take care of your wires. Happy wires are wires that will take care of your quad. And I'm gonna cut this guy to, um, I kinda wanna cut it to a similar length, but it doesn't need to go that way, does it? Okay. It's going to be shorter. I'm always suspicious whenever I cut wires to different lengths because I'm worried I'm going to get something backwards and then the wire's going to be wrong. Doom. Doom, 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 doom. And I'm not going to solder this in the holder because I think I'll melt the TPA. Um, I'm just going to solder it out on the bench. In case you're wondering, this is just a piece of silicon mat. It's just a literally a piece of silicon. I'm pretty sure what it was originally intended for was a pastry mat um, for rolling out pastries on on a countertop. It keeps the silicon keeps the pastry from sticking, like if you're rolling out a, a pie crust or something. Um, but I just bought a little bit of it and cut 
a little bit of it. Well, I was going to use it as a bench workbench cover, but it kind of looked like crap on camera. So I didn't like it and it's done, but it's great because silicon is very, very difficult to melt or burn. So it's great for soldering. It's very resilient. So we'll come from the side and we'll just get it started with some solder. And then having tinned the pad, I'm going to, this is what seems to be working the best for me. I'll come in with the wire and it's going to be angled down slightly. So we'll come out from this angle. Fingers crossed here. Sorry about that, guys. You couldn't see that at all. I was pushing on the wire just a little. Yep, looks good to me. Looks good to me. That's obviously, this is going to be a little neater, but it's basically where it needs to be. And it's fantastic. At this point, the ESCs are all soldered to the PDB and the main battery discharge leads are soldered to the PDB. And the next thing you might do if you're building a normal quadcopter is move outwards to the motors. In fact, I usually build my quadcopters from the motors inward. But what Catalyst Machine Works recommended to me is to build the entire sort of main body of the quadcopter. And then the last thing you do is you install the arms and the big motors. And that makes a lot of sense. Once we get the arms on here, this thing is barely going to fit on my bench. And the big motors are kind of the most terrifying part of the build. I guess these giant fets on the CSC are a little bit terrifying. So I'm going to let my soldering iron cool down and I'm going to switch back to my smaller tip to start doing some of the fine work connecting the PDB to the flight controller. And I mean, gosh, that's not going to be that different from a normal quadcopter build. But I do have something exciting for you guys. The flight controller I'm using on this build is the Brain FPV Radix. Now, this is a really cool flight controller that I have wanted to give some coverage to for a long time. I couldn't be happier that Catalyst Machine Works has decided it makes sense for this build. Two things make this flight controller stand out. And one is that it's got a graphical OSD. That means it it can actually draw much nicer graphics on the on-screen display than you're used to seeing from something like Betaflight OSD. Uh, Betaflight OSD is character-based, and that means it can kind of put letters anywhere you want on screen. And Betaflight can do graphics, but those graphics are all, they're actually little characters that it's just moving around on screen. The full graphical OSD on the Radix lets it do some pretty cool things. It also supports just regular old Betaflight OSD, of course. The other reason that the Radix makes a lot of sense for this build is that it uses a different gyro chip, the, the accelerometer and gyro chip that's, that then is used on any other flight controller, at least that I know of. The gyro is made by the company Bosch and they make, they make automotive and industrial stuff. And this gyro is particularly good at filtering the vibrations. You may be hearing about all the filtering that like is done in software, things like Helio Spring or Flight One. Well, this, this flight controller is doing awesome filtering right there in the gyro chip. And that means that Betaflight has less work to do and makes it fly awesome. And well, we'll see about that. But the real reason filtering and gyros are important is because this quadcopter is going to have way different vibration profiles than like a little five inch. The motors are going to be spinning at a different RPM and the props are going to have a lot more energy. So having great filtering on the flight controller is essential. I'm back. It's the next day. My soldering iron has cooled down. It doesn't take all night to do that. And I'm going to go ahead and change back to my thin tip because that is going to make more sense for the work we're doing today, the signal wires and stuff. I normally don't like using like the conical tip like this for general purpose work. I think the flatter chisel tip is better, but since we're changing tips anyway, let's give it a go. It is going to make sense actually the Conical tip makes more sense for the kind of work we're doing today. And uh, in keeping with that, we're going to bring the temperature of the iron down to 750 Fahrenheit. Y'all metric users can 
call up Mr. Google if you want to know what that is in uh, centigrade. <laughs> Oftentimes I do the conversion. You know what? I'm going to ask my editor to do the conversion for me. Stick it up on screen, editor. Thank you. I have someone who's helping me I'm with my editing lately. It uh, gives me more time to work on videos and some, sometimes play Apex Legends. I, I feel like the right thing to do right now is to... Um, punch you! Oh my god, I can't Dang. believe that happened. Oh no, I'm so stupid! I'm so stupid! <laughs> So we got to make sure we put these capacitors that on here that came with the ESCs. If you, it says even on the on the ESC packaging, do not power without without capacitor. Like definitely don't run the motors, but don't even power the dang things up. So we're just gonna add some solder here. I'm still working on finding the best way to do this. Uh, the first tip that I've got is to hold the capacitor in place while you're soldering using a piece of VHB tape. This is very high bond tape from 3M. It's way overkill for this job. I just like it for this. It, it holds way tighter than we need, but it's thin and it's going to hold everything in place while we solder very easily. The electrolytic capacitor comes with the ESC and it's going to go right here. This is actually the electrical symbol for a capacitor, if you didn't know that. And electrolytic capacitors are polarized, which means you must get the positive and the negative correct. Uh, in this case, it's impossible to get it wrong. They've pre-cut it for you and pre-bent it and everything. But if you get the polarity backwards, they will make a violent popping explosion. So I'm just going to press these legs in here and press the capacitor down so that the VHB tape is holding it in place. And then to just hit it from the side, like so, and let it flow in. Yeah, it seems to work pretty well. No, it's not fantastic. Yeah, let me do a little more, a little ice cream cone divot there. That means you need more flux. Let me put a little more flux on it and see. That I can get going here. If you ever get those, adding a little more flux will fix it. Oh, yeah, perfect. Oh, perfect. Flux is the key to beautiful solder joints, guys. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to solder up the signal and telemetry wires on the ESC. Um, the ESC also has a ground pad for an additional signal ground. But if you look at what we're doing, we've got, this is a giant 12 gauge wire going straight to the PDB and that little signal ground wire would be going exactly the same place. So unless there's something about the layout of this ESC that I don't know, which, uh, hey, there very well may be, for example, there might be a separate like filtered signal section of the ESC. Ooh, I should really ask Catalyst if they did recommend it. But for the time being, I'm not going to run the signal ground and I'll get back to you if I change my mind about that because it's just redundant. We've got a giant ground wire. Why well, put a little tiny ground wire right next to it? And if you are used to soldering on regular ESCs and flight controllers, this is kind of a weird joint, this edge joint here. At first I was confused because normally like the edge of the circuit board is not copper clad and you can't solder to it. But what they've done actually, it's a little hard for me to show, but they've actually got copper in here and this is the solder pad that you're gonna solder to. So I'm gonna do it from the underside because the cap capacitor's in the way from the top side. If I had been really smart, if this wasn't my first build, I would probably solder the signal and telemetry wires to the ESC very first thing before I do anything else and just have them dangling around there while I did the rest of the work. Live and learn. Don't worry, on my next Beast Class build, I'll do much better. <laughs> How many of these are you going to build, though, right? The conical tip of the iron is really perfect for this. It's going to be a little difficult to do this without the t getting in the way, but I'm just going to, and the iron tip like this, and just, does he just tin that pad? Just like so. I'm going to come in here, just lay it in there. And it with some heat to flow it. There we go. 
We got good connection there and good solder flow up there. Yeah. So there it is from the edge and from the top. No solder flow onto the top pad, but that's okay. We got plenty of solder flow on that thick edge pad. And then I'm going to go ahead and just put the ESC in this 3D printed holder as I run this wire just to make sure that the wire is, you know, the right length and everything. I'm going to try to come up from the underside here, I think is what makes the most sense. And then solder from the top side. Catalyst Machine Works sells these 3D printed ESC holders and um, they have, you can see here, there's a large cutout here and a smaller cutout there. I believe that the large cutout actually is supposed to go toward the PDB. Well, they're definitely not symmetrical. And when you put them in the other way around, the um, capacitor seems to bump up against them and prevent it from really gripping them. So I believe they need to go with the larger cutout here facing the PDB. And I'm just going to put the ESC in here to hold it in place while I solder the signal and telemetry wire to the PDB. Yeah, that seems about right. So it seems to correspond to this area here, whereas this is holding near where the FETs are, and then this is the motor output. So I'm just going to put it in there while I solder up the ESC to the PDB so that I can get the length of these wires about right. All right, folks, there you have it. There is the power section of this build, this beast class build, pretty much done. We've got the ESC soldered to the PDB and the signal and telemetry wire from the ESCs soldered to the PDB. There is a lot more work to do. The next thing we're going to do, I think, is solder up the flight controller. That's going to be the Brain FPV, but that is going to do it for this video. And as much as I would really love to just record this whole video and then put it out in one big hour-long part, this is the first time I've built anything like this, and it is going really slow. And that means I need to stretch. I can't just go like a week without releasing videos and then give you an hour long beast class build. I got to kind of stretch this out a little bit. So I hope you have enjoyed this. On one sense, all we did is solder some ESCs up to a PDB. But in the other sense, this is completely uncharted territory for me, working with stuff this big, working with equipment this expensive. So I'm super excited to see where it goes from here. I hope you will join me. There is a link to a playlist down in the video description. Uh, when you're going to do a multi-part series like this, the least you can do is give a playlist for you guys. So if you check the video description, there's a link to the playlist. There's also a link to all of the parts that I'm using. If you want to purchase this and follow along, I'm going to say this at the end of every one of my videos. If you do follow along and purchase this, you seriously don't screw this up for all of us. This is a really, really dangerous machine. Don't, don't kill anybody or yourself.